what it's like in Alaska. And I, I just, yeah, I'm, I'm ready to hear that now and be disillusioned. Yeah, I, I mean, I've never been to Alaska, so, mm. but. Uh, Wait, Moose Jaw's uh, Canada, not, 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 not Alaska. No, no, it's Canada. It's, it's ah. actually, it's in the middle of the flat prairies. I played American football many, many years ago in Moose Jaw. No. Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah. Hey, welcome to Bear Christianity. My name is John T. We do not have Melky or Laura with us on this one, so it's just me flying solo. But um, I would like to introduce our guest for tonight. Do you want to introduce yourself, Matthew? Sure. Uh, hi, John T. Thanks for having me on. And uh, hi to everyone who's listening. I'm Matthew Anderson. I am currently sitting in at uh, Maritime Canada. I am in Nova Scotia in a little village called Palmkit uh, by the Atlantic, the other side of the Atlantic Ocean from you. And I'm a Paul scholar who wrote a book uh, called Prophets of Love, The Unlikely Kinship of Leonard Cohen and the Apostle Paul. So I'm a fan of Leonard Cohen and I'm a fan of studying Paul. Fantastic. Would you class yourself as a fan of Paul? Because I feel like not every Paul scholar I've uh, spoken to has been a fan of Paul. I am, I am a fan of Paul. Part of the reason I got started writing this book was that I realized that I, while I'm a fan of both of these men, and I'm I'm putting men, I'm definitely mm. saying men, while I'm a fan of both of these men, I also realized that uh, I'm uncomfortable with parts of both of their lives and their works. And so that's partly what brought this book into being. Well, yeah, like, can you tell us a little bit about the, the journey? Because, uh, well, actually, before we even get there, for people who are listening to this who are like, Leonard who? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, can you give us a, a potted history of who Leonard Cohen was and 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 what 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 his significance has been? Uh, Leonard Cohen is uh, is one of the few. I mean, apart from the Stones and people like that. Like, the, actually, I was going to say one of the few, and now I realize how many aging rockers there are. But uh, <laughs> uh, Leonard Cohen was already old in the sixties. Yeah. Um, and yet he lived uh, long enough to become, you know, to fill stadiums um, way up to 2016. And somehow, so his his career actually started with him playing guitar in the kind of the folk scene and and um, Joan Baez and, and Bob, De uh, Bob Dylan, all of these people from the 60s. Um, and then he, he somehow extended that career. He had his ups and downs, and that's some of the interesting stuff of his life story. But then he came back starting around uh, 2011 or so. He, he came back and toured for another 15 years almost and was really filling uh, you know large venues uh, up until uh, very close to his death in 2016. Uh, and these these concerts were love-ins, uh, where people who who knew his some of his earliest work from the '60s uh, to some of his latest work, and and uh, you know uh, as we were talking about before we started officially recording, uh, I think and I think that you believe as well that some of his latest work is actually some of his best. Absolutely. So, yeah. So he was a, he was a, an incredible um, long-lived performer, um, but he also went through all different kinds of periods. So he had his folk period. Uh, and then he he did a kind of this weird, you know, the the 70s and the 80s were weird anyway. For but everyone. He, <laughs> yeah. But he 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 participated in some of that. And then um and then he actually spent almost 10 years uh isolated as a Buddhist monk. And then uh and then came back out of that kind of isolation of of, of sitting Zen. Of sitting Zazen, and he uh, and then he went on tour again in part because he'd been defrauded by his manager, and he all of his all of his money was gone, and he wanted to leave something for his children, so he went back on tour. And one of his jokes was uh, uh, that he would give on a at a concert when he'd say, "I you know I <clears throat> when I came back to tour, I was I was a I was a young um, I was a young idealistic kid of sixty five. <laughs> and so that's kind of the person he was. And he grew into his his old age and uh and it really I think made a difference to uh it made a difference to uh to his life to to uh to have come back on tour and to reconnect with audiences. And I think a lot of people uh who are not fans will probably know Hallelujah. I would imagine that's the uh, sure. the various versions 
of that. Um, uh, and I think probably many people, when I was kind of, um, you know, in the music scene in the 90s, I remember people who were into Leonard Cohen were people who you would consider to be more depressed than the goths, you know, that was, <laughs> which I think is an unfair, I, at the time I thought it was a little bit unfair because I just thought of him as kind of a folky singer. Um, but the more I listen to his stuff, the more I think, gosh, this man does have, uh, he, he caught the darkness, as as uh, as he says in, in one of the, the tracks on one of his later albums. But um, yeah, I mean, in terms of how you would describe his music to somebody who's never engaged with it, what, what, how would you describe it? Because there's a lot of cartoonish ways that you could talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think you're right. I mean, it's uh, he... He would laugh at himself, by the way, while he participated in all of that, so that he would, uh, you know, he'd say, God gave me the gift of this golden voice. But in fact, he would some, he had a range of about four notes, I think, <laughs> uh, at the end. But he, uh, he was, a, he was a, a poet of darkness. I would say that his music is, is always secondary to his poetry. Yeah. And always was, right, right to the beginning. Um, uh, his la last albums, his later albums, uh, his first ones were the kind of folky 60s thing. Um, but his final albums uh, play around with music quite a bit. And um, and he, a, a lot of them actually have a, have a semi-gospel feel in terms of the backup and the accompaniment. But then he'll he'll make fun of himself. Uh, and that's a slightly earlier song, but in his, uh, his sort of song, I'm Your Man, it's totally lounge lizard uh, yeah. music. Like it's totally lounge lizard. It's played on a little Hammond keyboard or something. I'm not sure what it is. Yeah, um, Casio, Casio keyboard, I think. And uh, and he's just he's really humming it. He's really building it up as if he's in some really cheap lounge, you know, where the drinks are nothing <laughs> and uh, the people have all seen their better days decades ago. And if and he, he comes up to you, do not go home with him. <laughs> no, exactly. He's not the person you want to go home with. Anyway, he uh, so his music. Um, near the end, uh, actually, it goes a bunch of different ways. There's stuff that's a little bit uh, plesmer sometimes. There's stuff that's a lot of gospel background. There's stuff that's, uh, uh, like, it's all over the map musically. Mm. Um, but I would say it's, um, I mean, it's not it's not pop. No. Although I think it's sometimes classified that way in stores. It's not pop. It's not, uh, it's maybe world music almost, because you get that variety within the, the opus, you know, yeah. uh, that you sometimes get in world music. Absolutely. Okay, so that's Leonard, uh, a complicated person um, as a person as well, because we spoke about him as the artist. Um, as a person, I think we'll probably get into this as we kind of compare him and Paul. But um, I, I remember watching that documentary, Leonard and Marianne, um, yeah. which is just heartbreaking. And I think incredibly beautiful. And if you've not watched it uh, and you're listening to this, you should definitely get. It. Is, it, is is it called Leonard Marion? I feel like it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. It, it it's just it's yeah it's heartbreaking, but also it kind of gives you an insight into the kind of complicated person that an artist can be if you're having to have a personal relationship with them. Um, another complicated person for a lot of people is Paul. Um, can you give us a potted history of Paul for people who don't really know much about him? Because I think everyone assumes, oh, he wrote most of the New Testament one. Is that true? Uh, and um, he hates women. And uh, then you have people who say, we don't follow Jesus. We follow Paul, basically. And he invented Christianity and a whole bunch of stuff in between. Um, give us your your kind of take, a, a, a potted bio of Paul. Yeah. Yeah. Uh Paul is an, was an incredibly complicated first century Jew uh, who was an apocalyptic eschatological Jew uh, who was a follower of Jesus without ever having met him. Um, and I, so I, what I would say is that if you, if you only know a little bit about Paul, the chances are pretty good that what you know is wrong. Right. I'll say that. Um, because um, the sort of popular reception of Paul from the church, which is even if you're not a church person, um, that's kind of the, that's the institution that has shaped the Western reception of Paul. And, uh, and it has basically framed him as this misogynist, uh, person who started Christianity, essentially. And, uh, you know, so Jesus preached the kingdom of God, but Paul came along and preached Jesus, changed it all, made it all about the, the person Jesus. And you even get that in, in the old, uh, Jesus biopics, like, uh, it's it's really old now, but the uh, 
the last temptation of Christ or something. You know, they have these scenes where Paul meets Jesus and Paul says, I don't care who you are. Yeah. You know, uh, I'm preaching about this thing and it's starting up. Or even there was a movie, 2018, Mary Magdalene. Um, and it was a little bit like that too, where where Magdalene becomes the hero trying to say, we're going to hold on to the teachings of Jesus. And it, it moves toward the official church. And if you're of a mind to separate the church, which God knows, you know, should be separated sometimes from the message. Yeah. But if you if you have a mind to do that, it's easy to hang the fault of the church on Paul and keep the, Jesus as being the sort of nice, you know, beautiful lover of all people hanging around with his buddies and, and everybody else in Galilee. Yeah. And it, that's not really true. And that's part of, part of the reason I wrote the book is to um, – is to redeem Paul a little bit. If I can, you say I can redeem Paul. I, I think you are now that powerful. You've been <laughs> yeah. on beer Christianity, so you've really arrived. So I, I, I have. I have. Thank you, John. T. Thank you. Yeah. So I wanted to save Paul from uh, a little bit, in my own small way, from from the kind of mis misperceptions of Paul. I, it turns out that if you actually think of him as a Jew, and not as a Christian, and start reading his letters that way, you start to realize that uh, he's not responsible for a lot of things that we that we hung on him later. Well, I think that's one of the interesting things um, that, that I liked about the book was that he, he they're, they're both men who are born Jewish, but take on completely different faith traditions and faith traditions that are quite hard to understand from the outside. Um, and is that is that the primary, like, kind of, is that the core of where you see the similarity between them? Or is it the the later mysticism? Or, I mean, you talk a bit about the asceticism of them both in the book as well. Um, and their relationship with women is complicated. And like, yeah. oh, it's a dumb and question. They, Actually, as I'm saying it, I'm like, fuck, when, how could he even, <laughs> like, so, and they, per they perform their masculinity, which is, I think, interesting, too, when you study the first century and, and stoicism, sort of middle stoicism. Um, you don't need to know all of that stuff, but, you know, essentially men have always performed masculinity and always thought that only women do that. Uh -huh. um, you know, we think that, you know, you watch your, uh, maybe you watch your partner putting on makeup and you go, you know, whatever, you know, uh, or it's just, it seems so hard sometimes um, because there seems to be such an obvious performance of femininity in our yeah. world. But of course, men perform just as much as women. It's just that it's the default It's by society standards. It's the default. And so we don't, uh, we don't notice how men perform masculinity. But one of the things that's interesting about comparing, putting Leonard and Paul side by side is that Leonard obviously performed masculinity, but when you start checking out Paul, he did too. Like Paul, uh, you know, he, he's saying things like, uh, <clears throat> I'll be all things to all people, but then he, he kind of trash talks in his letters when you actually look at it. Oh, I mean, uh, wait, doesn't he tell somebody to to cut their deck off? I feel like yeah, that's, like, that's, that's not seemly. You shouldn't put no, that in the Bible. No. <laughs> it's in Galatians, and he does. He says basically, he says, if you want to take away the foreskin, take off the whole thing. You know, I wish these <laughs> people would cast. It. And he uses words, you know, shit that that get fixed up and cleaned up by our translations. Um, he he performed. He he did the whole kind of you know rooster thing sometimes, Paul. Yeah, and uh, and we see this in in Leonard more clearly um but uh looking at leonard and paul side by side we see how it also affected paul i mean leonard was clear he was he was even marketed early on he was kind of marketed as the um as the uh, clearly this is a marketing to a 1960s 70s uh primarily male uh audience uh but he was marketed as the 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 knower of the secrets of what of women or something like this, like oh, wow. as a yeah. sort of a troubadour who knows the secrets. Yeah. And this uh, playboy and I, kind of vibe. Yeah. 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 And, uh, and I mean, he, just by being sensitive, you know, he, he, uh, he kind of got that reputation, I think. And he, he capitalized on it. Yeah. And that's something that's kind of continued in um, uh, kind of music culture and perceptions of music culture to today, where you have male manipulator music. Was Leonard Cohen the first male manipulator musician? Is that the like? Interesting. Could be. I mean, he, was, he was marketed that way, definitely. Yeah. 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 Oh, unbelievable. 
The um, troubadours, of course. Troubadour, yeah, exactly. Yeah. It's kind of like, well, I mean, I feel like a lot of people get into writing poetry because they feel like, well, you know, somebody is going to sleep with me if I write the right <laughs> poem. That's it. That's going to happen. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. the, Speaking for myself alone. <laughs> the, so. the guy with the guitar, the guy with the guitar gets to go on with somebody. That's Absolutely. it. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So um, you, you said that you, you started writing the book or you, one of the reasons you wanted to write the book was to redeem Paul. But, but what... What was, I mean, what brought you to going, because that's a cool idea, but like writing a book is a commitment. Like what, yeah. what, what really cinched it for you? What, what was the motivation? Well, uh, you know how, when you listen to really good lyrics, um, you like, I would listen to, I still listen to Cohen lyrics. I was listening to some this morning. Um, cause we, we live out of town and so you have to drive in and out to, to the university, and I was listening to uh, this this song, "Oh Love, Aren't You Tired Yet?" And Cohen had this habit of of singing a song that seemed to be about sex and about women, but in fact, when you actually sit down and parse it, is about God. Yeah. And and he and I I just sometimes he makes me laugh at the cheekiness of it, but also sometimes the profundity of it. And then I would go, yeah, but he's a ba- he was a bastard. I mean, in fact, he even says it. Yeah, what well, he's know, a lazy, lazy bastard, bastard. Yeah. bastard living in the suit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and and uh, and so, you know, I thought to myself, I, I, uh, as an academic, you always want to try and get the message, you know, some of your research out out as if you can. And I thought, um, uh, clearly not your co-hosts, but I thought there are a lot of people out there who do like Leonard. Yeah, screw <laughs> you, Malky and Laura. <laughs> <laughs> and and I thought, you know, um, those people who love Leonard, a lot of them don't know Paul at all, or they just dismiss Paul as, oh, that that uh, Christian misogynist, you know, who, who created such trouble. And um, and I thought that would be a way of talking about Paul within Judaism, which is this very dry topic. But at the same time, if I can relate it to, to Leonard and to these very deep lyrics, because I think Leonard said it better because he had the advantage of more time. And also closer to our time. So he said it in way romantic ways that we understand and sympathize with. But at the same time, a lot of the concerns were kind of the same. I think uh, since I wrote the book, I've been thinking more, you know, how you, you finish writing something or doing something and then you go, oh, I should have added that or I should have added that. Well, I, I wish I would have maybe added something about, about how they both challenged God, um, which is... You know, the trope is that that's a very Jewish thing to do. Hmm. Um, but in fact, it kind of is. I mean, I, <clears throat> you know, yeah. uh, and uh, and Cohen challenges God sometimes. And uh, and Paul did too. And I think that that's something that, especially if you're trying to do some good in the world, as an academic for me, um, you're trying to disabuse people of things that can cause harm. And one of the things that causes harm is anti-Semitism and always yeah. has. Yeah, absolutely. And there's a kind of a casual anti-Semitism in amongst a lot of very well-meaning Christians who would never outright say anything bad about somebody who's Jewish, but they, they'll still come up in church and go, oh, you know, they'll do, do a children's sermon or something. Not that I've seen this particularly, but, you know, they'll do a children's sermon and say, oh, that was in the time of the Old Testament when everybody was, you know, it was always about the law and people were miserable. But then Jesus came and everything became, you know, sunny and full of flowers. Well, yeah. it's not like that. Yeah. And uh, it never was like that. And uh, identifying Christianity as sort of new and good and the law and, Ju- and Judaism as old and bad. Um is just it's 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 uh, it's supersessionism. It's it's actually hate, even if it's in the guise of you know sort of innocent. Uh, that's what I picked up from my tradition, and so I thought that this this book could maybe help a little bit in that regard. Okay, so yeah. um, what are a few parallels between them in terms of um, their Jewishness and the way that they particularly expressed it and kind of lived it out over time? Uh, they both spent their uh, a lot of their adult lives traveling in the in the wider world, the non-Jewish wider world, in the diaspora, mm-hmm. and uh, yet they both held on to their Judaism and went to their graves uh, Jewish, and uh, uh, both of them had to kind of defend against that charge. Um, 
uh, Paul in Second Corinthians, especially, he you know he says, if anyone says they're a Jew, they're a Jew, well, I'm a Hebrew born of Hebrews. You know, I was yeah. circumcised on this day. I, you know, I'm of the tribe, and and all of these things that he says. And Leonard, you know, he actually wrote a, a not a particularly good poem, not one of his best, but he said something like, you know, if anyone says I'm not a Jew, they're not a Jew. You know, or he said one time about his his uh, his Roshi, about his uh, Buddhist master. He said uh, when he. I'm paraphrasing, so I probably don't have it quite right. But he said when he, when he tired of trying to get me to see something, he threw me back over the fence at the Torah. Nice and uh, yeah, and so you you get this realization that uh, and and Cohen, I mean he he uh, he ate kosher generally. He tried to eat kosher. He 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 did the Shabbat meals with his children uh, when he was with. I mean he wasn't necessarily the best father. I don't think always, but at the end, he really was. I mean his. He gathered his family around him in the final years, um, uh, and and he uh, and he also uh, connected with the synagogue. That uh, not surprisingly, his uh, grandfather, great grandfather on his father's side, had actually been one of the uh, uh, architects of starting that synagogue, um, Ashamayim in in Montreal. So he he was definitely very deep in the tradition, and so was Paul. I mean, he, Paul can't. It's in, one of the things about Paul's letters is that when he quotes. You would think he's talking to non-Jews. You'd think he'd be quoting Virgil and Homer, but in fact, what what is he? He's he's quoting, you know, the Torah all the time. Yeah, and and so they traveled in this wider world, but they kept that Jewish identity. That was one one commonality amongst very many. Um, one of the things I discovered about women was that I make the statement. I don't know if I make the statement, but I come to the conclusion that in fact, uh, Paul was. More lib uh, was more of a feminist than Leonard Cohen. I mean, not hard to be more of a feminist than Leonard no. Cohen. <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> at least early I mean, Leonard Cohen, you know. Yeah, uh, yeah. Well, the ancient man was more of a feminist than the modern. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm, and that was uh, one of the only ways you can say that is that you have to. Uh, I'm sure I'm not the first person to say this on your podcast, but you have to hive off the. Uh, the pastoral epistles and basically say to yourself, no, Paul didn't actually write these, even though they have his name on them. Yeah. Yeah. But, Explain yeah. that just quickly for, for, for those of us who, who are not familiar of how that works. Cause we're just like, Oh no, they were all written by Paul, right? Which were written by Paul. Were any of them written by Paul? Yeah. Well, uh, um, almost all, not all, but almost all uh, serious uh, people who've looked at, at the, the new Testament writings uh, critically uh, come to the conclusion that um, Paul did not write all of the letters that are attributed to him. Mm -hmm. And uh, that wasn't that uncommon, you know, in that day and age. And um, and uh, so uh, we know, basically, people talk about the seven that they're sure that he wrote. And then there's a couple that they're not sure. So the seven that, I mean, I don't know if you need the list or not, but it's yeah. you know, Galatians, Romans, First and Second Corinthians, uh, uh, Philippians, and Philemon. And what am I missing? I'm uh, missing one other. I, I went through their list. I should have gone through it. I'm you know, clearly so. a bad Christian. I, you know. <laughs> anyway, the, the seven letters that he wrote, and then um, the 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 letters of Second uh, Thessalonians, well, First Thessalonians is the other one, and Second Thessalonians and Ephesians and Colossians. People are kind of waver back and forth. Did he write these or not? And then uh, the pastoral, so-called pastoral letters, First and Second Timothy and Titus. Um, are, have Paul's name attached to them, but um, most s serious scholars don't believe that he wrote them. And the part of the reason for that is their view of women, but uh, even more important reason for that is that they they lack the urgency. You know, uh, for Paul, Jesus was going to return next uh, tomorrow, next week, next month, next year at the latest. You mm -hmm. know, within within the lifetime of the people around him, and. Um, and when you get to First and Second Timothy and Titus, it's all about oh, how do we keep the institution going? Ah. You know, how do you pass on the teaching to children? All the kinds of institutional concerns that you don't get in the actual what we what I would call the genuine letters. Yeah, and there's and you can tell that just because there's not that kind of imminent eschatology that's kind of saying it's it's happening. He's coming. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there's a bunch. I mean, that's one of the, the. That's probably the biggest thing is there's no imminent eschatology. The view of women is very, very different. You go from um, <clears throat> in First Corinthians, Paul is saying, "Don't have children." 
Yeah. The time's too short. Don't have children to, you know, in the pastorals, a woman can be saved through childbearing. Well, I mean, these, this is not, That's the, not same. the same dude. No. Yeah. 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 Um, and so the view of women is that, and then if you actually drill down to the vocabulary, uh, people who've done the studies of the specific words used find much more overlapping vocabulary between the, 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 the words used, the Greek used in the pastoral letters and documents from the second century. So much mm. later, you know, at least a half century later, okay. probably more. So he's he's rooted in Judaism, as is Leonard Cohen, and then, but both of them, as you identify in the book, have this. Um, I don't know if it's an obsession with Jesus. With Paul, it is maybe I would say, um, but there's a lot. Leonard Cohen, for a Jewish Buddhist, talks a lot about Jesus and uses a lot of Christian imagery. Um, where did that come from? What what was that all about? Well, well, Cohen was raised uh, in Montreal, where uh, apparently an American writer, um, um, uh, Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, said that uh, you can't, in the 19th century, you couldn't throw a stone and not hit a, a church in Montreal at that time. And uh, so Cohen was raised in this sort of fairly affluent neighborhood in Montreal, where there are still tons of churches, you know, on sort of every street corner. And he was raised uh, by his his father died fairly early, which also marked his masculinity, I think, um, raised by a, a fairly flamboyant and uh, a very outspoken mother. But he was left often to the care of nannies who happened to be um, good Catholic girls nice, and uh, who took him to mass quite often. And I think cool. he was entranced by the, the statues, a lot of statuary in Montreal, a lot of Catholic statuary. And, um, and I think he was, uh, he was, uh, you know, he admired these statues and the, especially Jesus on the cross for him became a, a, a very powerful, I think he was obsessed with Jesus to go back to what you said earlier. I think yeah. that Cohen was also obsessed with Jesus for the artistic, but also he said in a, in a speech once in Spain, that uh, a crucifixion, he said, that's where humanity is at. Hmm. And, uh, and he was talking not only about suffering, but also about, uh, brutality, yeah, and um, and I think you know he that was one of his his really his deep observations was that this kind of human cr this cruelty, yeah, uh, where you get the dignity within suffering, which is uh, so human, but you also get the the suffering that puts a person on the cross, the the cruelty that puts a person on the cross, yeah, and that's human as well. So you get these things brought together in this image on the cross. And in the Christian like understanding of it, that is the source of life, redemption, hope, and it's this act of horrific brutality, and yeah. and also surrender to death, which is not an uncomplicated thing to kind of contemplate. There's so much in it that is so very Leonard Cohen, actually, just in in the image of the the crucifixion, because so much of his imagery is so it it turns it turns your expectations on their head. Uh, it it brings a darkness, but can often bring a hope within it. Like he's, it, it, there's. I don't think it's anybody who may, maybe early kind of Bob Dylan who has that kind of way with imagery that that is genuinely it takes your breath away. Um, I think a lot of people in in kind of you know progressive Christian circles know the um, the there's a crack in the world. That's where is it? There's a crack in the world. There's what that's where the light goes gets in or. What is it, it's it's from Anthem uh, and uh, in the album The Future, nineteen ninety two. So quite early on for him, and uh, the the it's a great line. He says, "Ring the bells that still can ring." So even before you get to the other, that's a great line. Yeah. Ring the bells that still can ring. So it's good. already looking back, and then he says, "Forget your perfect offering." Now, you know Christians that I know, a lot of progressive Christians that I know, are uh, bedeviled by this idea of every. You know, they have to work so hard. I mean, you just have to be yeah. perfect. You have to try and be perfect. He says, forget your perfect offering. There is a crack in everything. And then the, the clincher, that's how the light gets in. It gives me goose flesh. And I mean, I've heard that so many times. Yeah, yeah, I have to. It, it's, uh, that's one of the things that caught me uh, when I was starting to think about comparison. There were a few little lines. There was that. And I thought, I, my mind immediately went to uh, Paul in 2 Corinthians 4. He says, we have this treasure in clay jars. Yeah. Um, so that it may be clear 
you know, he, we're, we're afflicted. So, and I think Paul had this idea of brokenness, you know, yeah. um, and that, uh, that humans are fragile vessels. So you get that kind of commonality between them. But for Cohen, um, I, I love it. Ring the bells that still can ring. And I think as he got older, he was trying to ring those bells that still can ring. That was for him. It's so, maybe I'm, maybe I'm a dumb Protestant. <laughs> and, and a lot even, of Protestants are dumb. Oh, hell yeah. And we have ugly <laughs> churches. Um, I, I'm and, a Protestant. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want to presume. You don't want to say that to a Catholic. That's a harsh thing no, to say. No, um, no, no. But, um, but like, he seems to be articulating my understanding of the Christian faith and what we're trying to pursue just in that line so perfectly yeah. and in so many of the lines that that he I, I i'm i'm taken back to um the song amen which has yeah. just got some incredible lines in it and some of them are just like oh you're just showing off at how cool you are like what well, tell me again that i know what you're thinking but vengeance belongs to the belongs lord to the lord <laughs> just such yeah. a great line oh. he uh, well i mean he worked at it and yeah. he brought he brought references in from the kabbalah from uh, yeah. from Jewish scriptures, from Christian scriptures, uh, from the Jewish Apocrypha. He he would quote stuff from the um, Pseudepigrapha, which most people don't even know exists. And he, you know, but was scriptural in the time. He also book, you know, he would bring in stuff from First and Second Maccabees, um, yeah. which which are scriptural. Yeah. But, but but especially Protestants don't have any idea what this stuff is. Absolutely. Most you have to pick up a Catholic Bible to see how yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, but he also would, you know, he would quote uh, Talmudic legends, or he would make reference to Talmudic re uh, um, legends, but also to, you know, the legend of Saint Christopher, or yeah. then to the the song of Bernadette from. I mean, you know, the like it was amazing, Joan of Arc. Yeah. Like he really tried to bring it all together, and I think for him that was, he would. I get the feeling from his lyrics that he was happiest when things would refer to three or four things at once. When one of yeah. his lines would refer to three or four things at once. Do you think, from what you know about him, I mean, I don't know if this is just common knowledge or whatever about his writing process, but did he did he painstakingly construct or was he just one of those people who's maddeningly gifted to to kind of just throw out these gems? No, painstakingly construct. Oh, wow, interesting. Like, for instance, that, that song, Hallelujah, that everybody uh, knows, um, he, he uh, apparently, you know, I wouldn't be surprised he was writing verses for that up until he died. I mean, he he just, like, he would write a verse and write a verse and write a verse, but he would also throw out other ones. Like, he was he was constantly revising and working um, and uh, and trying to get just the right. Like, he, there are very few cheap rhymes or no, you know, that's cheap it. lines. Every and, word uh, counts, and they're so yeah. smart, and they're so powerful. And even when they're not saying things that are, like, about, you know, the ineffable, there's there's... I'm just thinking about the lines in is it Avalanche, where um, almost every line in Avalanche is just like if you've had one of those love affairs, yeah. you know, yeah. you know what that's like, and it's just nobody. I, I saw a TikTok recently of some twenty-year-old who was saying, "Who even listens to Leonard Cohen? What's even the point?" And then he's just some old dude from the '60s, and then the next frame of the TikTok is this person just standing absolutely stunned at the latter half of Avalanche, and yes. just every lyric just landing so perfectly. It's it's incredible. Yeah, yeah. No, he. I, that's the thing that um, uh, uh, Cohen. And then he every now and then he would stick in something that was just funny. Yeah, you know, just to make I I love the like almost like the blues. Um, he has this. Uh, um, I have to die a little between each murderous thought, and when I'm finished thinking, I have to die a lot. There's torture and there's killing. There's all my bad reviews. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the war, the children missing, Lord. It's almost like the blues, and then he ends off that one. There is no God in heaven, and there is no hell below. So says the great professor of all there is to know. But I've had the invitation that a sinner can't refuse. And it's almost like salvation. It's almost like the blues. How is this not a Christian line, though? Yes. This is my yes. thing. Like, yes. oh, I guess that's a that's a very Protestants want to define, or maybe Christians want to define. This is Christian, and not somebody else who has encountered Jesus, had a profound encounter with him, and understands his message entirely. But until you call yourself a Christian, we're not satisfied. Do you think that's what's yeah. happening here in me right now? <laughs> so I'm just like, well, it sure sounds. A lot of it does, and and I I wrote the book, uh, um, doing a lot of research on things. But there's a book by Harry Friedman called the uh, uh, 
uh, the mystical genius of Leonard Cohen, essentially, yeah. um, the mystical roots of genius. And it was interesting because when you talk about lines that really seem Christian, there's a, a wonderful song that he, that Cohen wrote called Show Me the Place. Oh, what a and, song. Oh, yeah. And, and the words are, if I, if I can say Go some of them. Go do the whole thing. Show me the place where the, uh, show me the place, uh, help me roll away the stone. So now right away, you start to get twinged a little bit on the difference. Help me roll away the stone. Show me the place. I can't move this thing alone. Show me the place where the word became a man. Mm. Show me the place where the suffering began. It's such a great now, song. Yeah. And you're kind of, you're going, well, obviously, if you're a Protestant or uh, most Christians are going to go, well, that's Easter, you know, show me the yeah, rolling away yeah. the stone. But, you know, Harry Friedman, who's Jewish, I think, uh, when he was talking about mystical roots of genius, he looks at this and goes, oh, this is a reference to um, to Jacob, who had to roll away the stone and so, to be able to get oh, water yeah. and to be able to go into the the marriage, you know, to be able to court the yeah. daughters of, of Laban. And he says, this is the suffering. He had to undergo 14 years of suffering. And of course, it, you know, that makes sense yeah. too. Yeah. And I think Cohen somewhere is, you know, laughing in, in the Tower of Song is laughing, going, yes, yeah. it means both, you idiots, you know. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. maybe the issue is not, did Leonard's Cohen, Leonard Cohen's faith amount to Christianity any more than did Paul's faith amount to Christianity? Because it was so different from what what I would understand as a kind of evangelical or post-evangelical, um, but more maybe we need to change our understanding of what Christian faith is actually at its core and what Leonard can teach us. And maybe if we, we kind of reassess Paul, what he's trying to say. Yeah, that's, that's exactly it. If we uh, re understand Paul, however we do it, and, and you can do it through Leonard, if you're a fan of Leonard through this book, but uh, however you re-examine Paul, re-examine Paul. And once you start of you know, take Paul away from the cathedrals and the the weddings and the ceremonies and the popes and the bishops and the Southern Baptist preachers and everybody else and put him back into the first century as much as possible for us to do. Uh, you know, he may, he was the apostle to the non-Jews, to the Gentiles. But really, um, I think his his eyes were always set on on Jews, on his fellow Jews and on the redemption of of Judaism, of, of the Jews by their God at the end of time. And frankly, he was bringing in the Gentiles because, you know, think about the the gospel. I know it's the gospels weren't written by Paul, but the gospel story of the last, the wedding banquet, mm. you know, the, um, the, the, the non-Jews that Paul was going to were the spectators for the redemption of the people of the chosen mm. people. And somehow the church turned that around within a few centuries to where the Jews were, were the bad considered. Guys. Yeah, the bad guys and considered to be have been dumped by God for some reason. Yeah, in favor of the new chosen people, the Christians. Yeah, and uh, that's not what Paul's. When you read Paul carefully, that's not what he's on about. He's much more like Leonard Cohen, in fact. It's so interesting though, because a lot of, a lot of my understanding of Paul. Is not, and maybe it's not Paul. Maybe it's just a lot of the New Testament stuff. But my understanding of it of like the difference between the old covenant and the new, uh, the law and um, Christ and all that kind of stuff is, uh, you know, it's it's helpful, but I've never, I've never seen it as a like, oh, the Jews are dumb or no. the Jewish faith is dumb because, well, that was the faith that Jesus Christ practiced. But it is quite helpful in separating out uh, Christian faith from, um, and especially like evangelicalism from a kind of blunt and aggressive Christian Zionism, um, uh, which, yeah, I mean, again, we're, that's that's a whole other podcast, obviously. But yeah, yeah it's just, it's just uh, you know, hard to navigate that. Well, for me anyway. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, and I'm, I'm not really qualified to talk in with any knowledge about that, except that I have my visceral reactions to certain things, you know. Yeah. Um, but uh, but I it's not that Paul didn't care about the people he was uh, doing, but I th you know I think he was a Jew, remained a Jew, yeah. And if the if the God of of Israel, and I'm talking ancient Israel here, if the God of Israel, yeah. you know, was was opening the the gates and inviting to the banquet all of the nations on yeah. the last only because you know I think of it like a five minutes to midnight f uh, fire sale on everything in the store, you know, yeah. and that's 
because the, the the society as we know it's going to end next week, next month, next year. Yeah. So in this last moment, you invite everybody in. Yeah. And um, it's a far cry from, you know, you're invited in because it's the last minute to you're the true people of God and we're just. Oh, yeah, know, absolutely. Yeah, that. no, actually. Okay, no, I totally get that of like somehow yeah. the Gentiles are more important than than Jewish people, which is yeah. obviously insane. We're okay. like the uncool people who got invited to the party who take it over. Yeah, again, because that's because that's <laughs> grace, right? <laughs> yeah, well, in a sense, that is grace. Yes. Yeah. Um, yep. Okay, so there's a there's a mysticism to Leonard Cohen, I think, spiritually. Like it's it's there's so much kind of parable. There's so much imagery that seems to take you almost directly into the experience of. Is it of God or is it of like a kind of spiritual truth that I don't feel like is present in Paul? But is that because I'm so familiar with Paul that his metaphors and his imagery have become uh, just feel like the kind of they're they're already there? They're part of the furniture. Is that? Do you think that's part of it? Because like I th I think about um, uh, substitutionary atonement. And and those kinds and, and the different ways in which scripture talks about salvation, there there are competing, if not conflicting, images for what Jesus dying on the cross meant, what it was for, what it did, sure. um, and and I guess that's just coming up with images, with poetry, with with uh, analogies to try and make you understand something that is. You could come at it from multiple ways to try and understand it. Is there is there a parallel there? Yeah, uh, I think. I mean, uh, one of the big differences between Leonard and Paul is that uh, Leonard doesn't want to go past the cross, particularly for him. I mean, for him, looking at Jesus on the cross, even though he is kind of obsessed with Jesus on the cross, that's where he stays because that's the predicament of human suffering mm. and seeing where the light might shine in through that darkness. Um, but it's not, uh, you know, he, uh, Cohen doesn't go very quickly if it goes at all to any kind of a resurrection. I mean, he's not a, yeah. he's not as a, you know, he's not a Christian, or he's not a post Easter kind of a believer of God. Yeah. And, and because he's Jewish. But Paul is also Jewish, but was part of that Jesus movement and had his vision of Jesus, you know, as he says in yeah, 1 Corinthians 15. Um, uh, but what you were saying is it, it is the, uh, you started off saying about the poetry, and do I just miss the poetry because Paul's become, Paul's letters yeah. have become part of the furniture? I think that's a danger for everyone who has been exposed to Paul's writing. But the other thing is, is that um, it's a little about comparing apples and oranges. Uh, Cohen uh, worked for decades on on lines of poetry and just polished them and polished them and polished them. Um, to make a, a and also tried to make them multivalent so that they would have that wonderful metaphor so that they could refer to you you know when you're going through a breakup you'll you'll feel brought in by a song and Cohen worked consciously to try and do that with his his lyrics like any good uh, poetry writer whereas Paul's letters are kind of first century emails most of them yeah you know so they're just taking care of business and yeah. that's why most of his his writing is just taking care of business and so it's a it's it doesn't he's not trying to move our hearts with most of it now the few passages where paul does try to move our hearts like uh you know love is patient love is kind um i think the poetry stands up pretty well yeah, uh, compared sure. to cohen um and there are people who and you know within the biblical studies guild there are people who argue that this stuff predates paul and he takes it on you know who knows we don't really know the origins, but it, they're there in his letters, this stuff. And so the poetic material from Paul, it actually stands up, some of it stands up quite well in, in the book, uh, which I do want to just say again, I, I have a book. You do have uh, a book. Well, remind me what the title of that book is. Oh, uh, thank you. Prophets of Love, The Unlikely Kinship of Leonard Cohen and the Apostle Paul. By Matthew uh, R. Anderson, published yeah, by? Um, McGill, McGill Queens University Press. McGill Queens, excellent, great. Twenty twenty three, but in the in the book, um, one of the things that I really tried to do was that I I did a couple things. One is that I never referred to him as Saint Paul; it was always Paul, mm -hmm. and I always referred to I tried always to refer to Leonard Cohen as just Leonard. So I would put Leonard and Paul rather than 
colon and the apostle or saint or whatever. Mm. And the other thing I did was that I had a big argument with the publisher. I said, I do not want to put um, on the biblical passages, I don't want to put chapter and verse. Yeah. And they said, why? I mean, the, the proof editor went crazy because, you know, that's their job is to try and nail everything down. And to and go she, crazy. <laughs> yeah. And uh, and I, I said, no, because if I put a lyric beside a lyric, I don't want one of them being identified as scripture, you know, yeah. in quotation marks. And uh, there are places where, not many, but a few places where I switch from Leonard to Paul or from Paul to Leonard. And you have to take a second because they almost sound the same or very similar. And that nice. was fun. That was a lot of fun. I love that in the book. And I, I also just want to say up front that for SEO purposes, we're going to call him St. Paul on the title of this. I'm sorry. Oh, yeah. No, no. I I, I mean, and I put, I think, the Apostle Paul, Yeah. Uh, even even though, uh, even within the New Testament, I mean, the book of, most people don't realize, the book of Acts, even though it loves Paul and, you know, talks about yeah. him forever, it never calls him an apostle. Interesting. Wow. Or maybe in one, yeah, because I think that the writer of Luke Acts was mm, on the some, fence. <laughs> yeah, yeah, on the fence about him as an apostle. He was an important, but was he an apostle? Interesting. And Paul himself in Galatians, you know, talks about how he's, you know, uh, being maligned by others as not being an apostle. And in First Corinthians, he defends himself, you know, that I saw Jesus too. Now you have to say, you know, he saw Jesus much later in a vision, but for him, it seemed to be the same thing. So this apostle title. I honestly think, just as a total side note and tangent, that if we wanted to get more people into reading scripture, this may be another way in. You had Leonard Cohen, but now it can just be the bitchy infighting of the <laughs> early church. Spill the tea. That's the next one. It's just like, who hated who? Who was fighting with whom? Who's actually pretending to be somebody who they're not? I love that as a way in. Oh, some of them were such charlatans. I actually am working on Jerome right now, and yeah. you cannot believe like what a what a self uh, promoting huckster. Really? He, oh my God! The he's father terrible. of theology. That's the, uh, oh, I mean, wow. he, he was. You read his letters, and they're they're funny. They're funny. There's such blatant self promotion that they're funny. Amazing. And uh, so anyway, yeah. So you're right. I love that. Uh, Good. All right, you're there already. Excellent. You don't need <laughs> many my suggestions. Okay, there's a song that I have always wondered if I'm alone in 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 my thoughts about its kind of religious meaning or if I'm just projecting onto it. And that's different sides from mm. new ideas. Yeah. Um, with the, the just absolute dynamite line of um, uh, both of us say there are laws to, to obey, but frankly, I don't like your tone, which yeah. to me is a conversation between you know, spiritual religion and fundamentalist religion. But but is it actually a conversation between Buddhism and Christianity or uh, Christianity and Judaism or Buddhism and Judeo-Christianity? What? Because there's, I mean, it has just got so many incredible lines in that whole thing. I, I mean, and, and also down to the, what the, the next line is the, you want to change the way I make love, but I want to leave it alone, which is a personal thing that you could be having a conversation with a person, but it's also these religions that want to legislate the sexual life. Um, yeah. You know, yeah. like this again. It just does so much work and on so many levels. But but what is that? What is that song about? This is so self-serving because I just love that song personally. What do you think it's about? Um, I think it's. I, I don't. This is not a cheat answer. I think it's about most of those things because I think that Cohen designed it to be about most of those things. Okay. I mean, that's what he did. He he would have been happiest if it applied several different ways. But I do I do want to point out that of all of the possibilities that you give. I think he had an ongoing interest in comparing Christianity and Judaism. Um, and it goes right back. The, his very first book of published poetry was called Let Us Compare Mythologies. Nice. And um, and this wasn't even a song. Like this was uh, 13 years before he came out with his first uh, LP. Hmm. And... Uh, and it says a lot of interesting things. Uh, there's, a, there's a poem about Jesus called For Wilf and His House, that, uh, where he, he talks about Jesus on the cross. But the, the song that you're talking about, um, I, I'm, it reminds me of another line in another song. Um, uh, the, uh, um, down, uh, down, oh, oh, my goodness, I've forgotten the line, but it's, uh, uh, 
uh, the, the broken heart below our, our teaching. No, the hearts below are teaching to the broken heart above. Nice. Like so, this idea of of, uh, of if we can find some unity mm. in our as people that we teach God, which I mean, what a brazen yeah. concept. But I think that's a part of it. But it's also um, he has this one uh, uh, from from above. You no, know, from here it looks like two. He says, but from above it's one. Yeah. And so yeah, he, ha- he keeps having this this idea of uh, of let us compare mythologies from that very first book. Mm-hmm. I think it keeps repeating all the way through his his opus, you know, um, to the very end. Um, uh, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that he uh, he has um, in going home. He has um, I want to make him. Oh, that's that one about I, he's a yeah. sportsman and a shepherd and a lazy bastard living in a suit. Um, but he has, uh, uh, you know, tell me that this doesn't sound like a prophetic call. I want to make him certain that he doesn't have a burden, that he doesn't need a vision that he only has permission to do my instant bidding, which is to say what I have told him to repeat. That's amazing. And I have never heard the prophetic expressed so excitingly. Yes, me neither, me neither. Um, but I, I think a part of his prophetic mission he felt was to, I, I, he was a kind of an inter, he was kind of an interfaith. I mean, I think he would shy away from claiming anything like that for himself. It would have hurt sales and also, <laughs> You know, yeah. hurt his hurt his game, so to speak. Yeah. But I think that you know, underneath he was he was trying to find. I mean, he was a, he was a, a Buddhist monk. He was Jewish through and through. He uh, knew Christianity very deeply, and uh, and and um, Sufism. Like, uh, mm-hmm. and yeah. then when you, I, I'm sure that I mean, you talk about uh, mysticism quite often. I, so you know, like myst- the mysticism of different religions looks more similar to each other sometimes. Yeah. Than than yeah. the orthodox kind of strains that they've come yeah. out of. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. Yeah. yeah, because maybe they're coming again. It comes down to that. Maybe it's it's the way you look at it and the way you look at that kind of truth that that God is revealing. Um, you know, if you if you can step aside from the the, the structure, uh, you can maybe see something more interesting in the in the poetry and and in the. The direct encounter with God, I guess. That's the... Yeah, that's that's it. That's the the reported, unmediated uh, encounter. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's always reported, of course. So yeah, but still, you know, yeah. that ain't nothing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah. You're cutting out yeah. one middleman at least. Yeah, um, that's it. <laughs> okay, we haven't even done this yet, so let me ask you: What are you drinking, and where is it from? Because you showed me this earlier, and it's so cool. Yeah, so uh, I'm drinking a beer called Moosehead. Which I think is, uh, you know, stereotypically Canadian, and uh, it's brewed in Saint John, New Brunswick, which is uh, I'm in Nova Scotia, so it's the next province over. It's part of the Maritime, that is the the provinces of Canada that sit on the Atlantic Ocean, um, and um, and it's it's a it's a nice clean lager. It's a very straight up kind of a clean lager. It's uh, it's nothing fancy. It's uh, I don't know what they think about it in the in the pub down the street. Uh, in Nottingham, where I was for for a while with my wife, uh, Dr. Sarah Parks, but it, but a Moosehead is a nice, clean lager, you know, sort of almost a Bavarian style lager or something like that. Okay, that looks great. That's uh, you know, yeah. you're the first person in a long while on this show uh, who's been drinking beer, <laughs> mm. <laughs> which is because uh, you know I just feel like we've we've been absolute um, scumbag charlatans by not drinking beer for a long time. So thank you for helping us. Um, I've been drinking my own version of an old fashioned, uh, which I made with brown sugar, Woodford Reserve. Uh, Angostura bitters, and then I chucked in some orange juice as well. So I think I'm an actual Vulgarian. <laughs> well, it somewhere sounds good, actually. I mean, it tastes fantastic, but somewhere yeah, yeah, yeah. a real bartender is kicking a hole in a bar right now <laughs> and in rage. So saying what brown sugar? Oh, no. <laughs> Outrageous. <laughs> um, uh, in terms of uh, kind of wrapping things up, um, Leonard Cohen, uh, his. His legacy is, I think, a lot of people who value him as a poet but don't value him necessarily at, at the kind of spiritual level or faith level that you've been going, you know, going into uh, his stuff. Um, and I think there's a there's been a movement of late 
among certain kind of uh, cultural commentators to say scripture is valuable and the Christian church is valuable. Um, you don't have to believe any of this stuff. You don't have to have any of, um, you know, get involved in any of the, the faith nonsense. It's just good because Western culture was based on it and therefore, um, you know, it's got, it's got a cultural value. Uh, is it, is there a parallel there, or is is Leonard at least, you know, uh, able to be enjoyed that way if that's how you want to enjoy him? Um, well, I yeah. mean, I think you can enjoy Leonard on many levels. So yes, you could you could yeah. enjoy him that way. I mean, I'm I think that that view is a little bit problematic and can easily lead. Uh, no, racism is not a word that you want to toss out lightly, but that kind of uh, oh, yeah. sort of conserve our culture because Christianity is a part of that culture, it can lead can lead to racism. So and often sort of a, does currently. Yeah. I'll I'll go way further. Yeah. 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 Um, and so and Cohen would not have done that. And I'm by the way, I don't know that I've mentioned just how problematic Cohen was in terms of his misogyny. And I do want to signal that I don't shy away from that. Um, you know, he uh he was uh incredibly misogynist, especially the younger Cohen. Mm -hmm. And um and there are you know, the only there's a great article called uh, "Looking at Leonard Cohen Again Through a Me Too Lens," for instance, something mm -hmm. like that. And uh, there's zero doubt that he, I think I used the line, he turned his lyrics into, or he turned his experiences into lyrics rather than litigation. Um, wow. But part partly he escaped all of this, frankly, by being so old and dying. Yeah, I think so. I'm not trying to sugarcoat, you know, brown sugarcoat that part of his life. I'll say that. Um, but uh, in more in response to your question, that uh, I mean, I th I think you can examine Christianity as an artifact, if you want to put it that way, through Leonard and Paul, mm. if that's what you want to do. But I don't think you'd be catching Cohen. It'd be, you know, um, uh, he's he's a mystic. He really is. I think that that. You know, despite all of the layers of performance, mm. I think that underneath all of that stuff, he is a mystic who had who kept having experiences of the divine in some way. And I think Paul, you know, um, for those people who dismissed him as kind of the first bureaucrat of the church or something, mm. uh, if you dig down and you you know move off the pastorals and dig down into the the seven um, uh, authentic letters. You can see the the mystical experience and the real passion there as well. And on that level of passion, I think they come together, not without problems, both of them, but but uh, in a way that that helps to find a human experience. It's really <clears throat> that 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 way of looking at life is more of a cultural. You know, let's hold on to the cultural edifice. Mm, mm. But both of these both of these people were talking about a lived spiritual experience, and so I think it's far more. You'd miss the power if uh, if if you didn't. It didn't take that into account. Tell people somewhere where they can start for if they wanted to get into Leonard Cohen. Um, I wouldn't start with his younger stuff. I would start with, uh, you know, one of my, I mean, they, they change all the time, but one of my faves is uh, Old Ideas. Same. Which is, yeah, yeah, I love that. Uh, 2012 album, Old Ideas. Yeah. And it's got, uh, it's got some fun stuff on it. It's got that different sides. Yeah. You know, that you were talking to about. It's got Show Me the Place that we were talking about earlier. It's got Come Healing, which is this beautiful oh, what song. What a song. What yeah. a song. I mean, Come Healing of the Altar, Come Healing of the Name. You yeah. know, can you can you get more, more Again, religious it just, than that? Oh, it just yeah. gives me shivers. Yeah. Yeah. And he's got Amen, as we were talking about, Going Home. Yeah. Um, oh, Going Home say, is also stunning. Yeah. He's got, uh, you know, I would also take. Um, I would, if you got two albums, I, I would argue for two, two uh, 2012's Old Ideas and 2014 Popular Problems, because um, you, you've got in Popular Problems, you've got Samson in New Orleans, you know, let's uh, take my hand and help me pull these this this edifice down, like yeah. incredible social yeah. commentary. Yeah. But you also have this song, um, a wonderful song, You Got Me Singing. And he even, he they, you know, speak of intertextuality or intratextuality. One of the lines there is, uh, you got me singing, even though the news is bad. You got me singing the only song I ever had. You got me singing, da, 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 you got me singing the Hallelujah hymn. Oh, like man. he's making, he's making fun of himself. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Is, you know, and oh, uh, so, so those two, those two albums, I, I would say are great places to start. Brilliant.
Oh, yeah. well, um, thank you so much, Matthew, for spending time with us. Um, Prophets of Love, The Unlikely Kinship of Leonard Cohen and the Apostle Paul is available on... You can get it through Blackwell's. Blackwell's, um, great. That's fine. Yeah, yeah for that. Yeah. And it's um, by Matthew Anderson. Um, if you want to find out more about Beer Christianity, you can find more at beerchristianity.co.uk. Uh, we're on Instagram. We're on x we're on facebook we're on about you know a, a few crystals of meth sometimes no we're not but we're yeah we're on we're on a lot of those places if you want to find us you can email us beerchristianity at yahoo.com tell us your favorite leonard cohen songs and what they mean to you um matthew thanks again for joining us oh it's such a pleasure to thank you thanks for the invitation bye bye